Hi, my name is Juan Salazar and I'm the editor of dataeconomy.com. With me is Dr. Robert Cook, who is a technical presenter at Wolfram. Welcome, Robert. Hello. Um, I'm going to start with a very straightforward question. What are you presenting, or what did you present yesterday at Data Natives? And why do you think data has become so important in everything pretty much these days, in business, in government, in policy, in education, etc.? Okay, well, so yesterday I was asked to come along and run a short workshop looking at ways to use the Wolfram language, what was Mathematica, to do data science analysis and machine learning. And it was quite, you know, a fun short workshop. We had three hours to go through everything from the bare basics of how do you run your first piece of code up to how do you construct a deep convolutional neural network. And one of the things we've found is that over the years, the software itself has kind of grown out to be an all-encompassing computational platform. You can do most types of technical computing there. But most of our users find it quite hard to get to grips with the language for the first time. It's laid out quite differently to other languages. So we're doing more and more work to try and come out and teach people how to use the language. Uh, our CEO, Stephen Wolfram, has actually recently written a book, an elementary introduction to the Wolfram language, just to help highlight what the bare bones are, the basics of the language, to help people get started. As for your second question, why do I think data is important? I mean, I do some work back in the UK looking at analysing healthcare, uh, taking routinely collected data from the NHS and comparing it to things like when patients undergo adverse events, slips, trips, falls, what their general heart rate and temperature on the wards looks like. And the reason we want to do this is because for too long people have been basing policy and decisions on gut instincts. People have been collecting data in most fields for nearly a decade now. But the problem is, is more and more people have just been siloing it. They've been looking for data and they've been looking for statistics without actually thinking about what it tells you. They're looking for information over insight. That's where data science starts really taking hold. It gives you techniques where you can decide between if you want to run methods that are quite difficult to interpret, so things like your deep neural networks where you can get great predictive power, versus the sorts of data projects where instead you want to stay with techniques that might be you know, less powerful, more traditional, your linear regression, your logistic regressions. But what you get from those is, is a level of insight and a level of actual interpretation of the data that you wouldn't get in other places. And these insights can start shaping policy and decisions for governments or businesses. And just, they give you the edge over other people. I think that's a really key thing to the data science now and why it's become so, so uh, popular. Okay, so insight over information, it pretty much sums it up. Yeah. That's great. Um, so your background is in chemistry and in physics. Yes. Well, your academic background. Um, how, how did this background in chem like as a chemist and a physicist helped you develop sort of a liking or a passion for data science? And where do you see these disciplines uh, meet? Okay. Um, so yeah, my background, I was an experimental scientist. And I, it's quite difficult to draw the line between a traditional scientist and a data scientist. All scientists will have data of some type. To my mind, the real difference was, I mean, the, the, really, the key thing for why I could move from one to the other was because as an experimentalist, I was trained to be pragmatic, first and foremost. So all we cared about is, can we get a result? Can we get something that is nearly right? We've got to state our assumptions, fine, but we can make them. When you work in theory, sometimes you start a little bit more, a little bit harsher. You want to try and work with the fewest assumptions possible in a simple system. Any experimentalist will go, well, I would love to work on a simple system, but sometimes you'll just have variables beyond your control. If you talk to any complexity scientist, any system biologist, and they'll tell you, we're working on complex systems, we're working on things that are difficult. I cannot control all of the free variables of a human being. And that's kind of the overlap, is you've got to be pragmatic with data science. All these techniques exist that are powerful, but none of them are ever quite perfect. Your data will be messy. Your subjects will be weird. Your, I mean, your patterns may not be exactly how you want them to appear. So you've got to start, sort of, you've got to take the techniques you can understand. You've got to take the techniques that you've learned, and you've just got to start applying them. I mean, you might start out with a really basic model, but it can tell you something and then you can build on that. And it's that kind of, that iterative, it's almost it's like the scientific method. It's like experimenting. It's, it's exactly, yeah. It's experimenting, but with code, which kind of, it's, it's the offset from traditional coding where you kind of go, right, I know exactly what I, what I want to do. I know exactly how my code should behave. And you can create your app or your platform or whatever. 
data science, it's much more, I've got a gut feeling that something may or not be true, let's prove it. I think that's kind of the overlap between science and computation is where we're now seeing data science take off. This idea of being pragmatic and more or less playing with your data just to see what you can do out of it. Um, now, um, you mentioned that uh, well, the, the first part of your answer was that you're, you were an experimental scientist, you, you are. Um, how does your training as, a, as an experimental scientist influence your approach to consulting? Um, I think more ge like generally or broadly, what is your role at Wolfram? Mm -hmm. uh, how does your training as an experimental scientist influence your approach to consulting, if it does? And specifically, do you use, are there any tools that you use on a day-to-day -day basis that are absolutely necessary? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll probably answer your question in reverse and probably have forgotten the first part of it by the, fa the last part of it. In terms of the tools that I use day in and day out, the two absolute workhorses I have are a SQL database to carry all of the data. Any big data project, anybody that says, but how are you going to work with all that? I just always go, look, let's, let's set up SQL. It's tried and tested, good database solution. In terms of the analysis, I always work out of Wolfram Mathematica. I like the software because it's easy to work with other programming languages from it. It gives me all the types of mathematical tools that I'll need at my fingertips. And in most of the cases, they're pretty well automated and they're nice and versatile. So I can set up one stream of analysis and then just apply it in different cases, in different ways, cross-sectioning my data however I see fit as I go. And it's pretty instantaneous. You start getting out responses pretty much in the five or ten lines of code that you're interested in. And that's what lets me really be quite reactive in the way I do work. Now, what that means is that the way I actually can do the consulting work, so when I sit down, I get given you know, streams of Excel files, SQL databases, free text files. We end up with really messy data projects. If I get called in, it's normally because the client has kind of gone, we have been collecting all this data. We've not really been certain what we wanted to do with it. So, you know, one person was taking it in this way, somebody else was taking it in that way. We think that this signal could also be important in it. And it gets passed down to me to kind of go, what can you do here? Like, find a way to bring together all of these distinct disparate data streams, make sense of them, pull them together, and then most of the time I'll do 90% of my analysis by just chucking in things like correlation statistics and autocorrelation functions just to see where the key signals are. So it's, it's mostly in the beginning it's just organizing like these, the, this, this, the massive amounts of data that people have without a real structure. Yes. That's, that's the, the sort of the nitty gritty part. Yes, structuring the unstructured data, finding any way to even just align your weird data sets. I would say it's easily 90% of the work that you'll actually do on most data science projects. If people in the world could have learned a decade ago what we would be using now for technologies to store and handle data, our jobs would be a hell of a lot easier than they really are. But, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If we could go back and tell people, ah, you see, in 10 years' time, you'll be wanting to access this from a SQL database, that's what they'd have built out every time. I've got an interesting story, actually. Um, I was doing some work a while ago for the NHS. I had some Excel spreadsheets that had been handed off to me, and they'd been kept each month by a member of the nursing staff. Lovely, lovely person. Um, but it turns out that after a certain month, the way she'd saved the file, it was actually ghosting a set of data through. So there was an extra sheet stored in the, in the Excel file every month that you couldn't see when you opened it in Excel. But when you opened it in Mathematica, there was just this extra vestigial sheet floating there from something like July 2009. And to my mind, first and foremost, that's just weird. The fact that you can get that sort of data leakage where just like this single file is just like sitting there somewhere in the ether, taking up space, taking up memory, at times throwing your code slightly weird because there's this exception that you were never expected to deal with it's until like you hit that date. Matter. Exactly. <laughs> and I, mean, I think that is when we are, when we're talking about cleaning data, we are like digging through the darkness of the data because you're never going to sit down and get someone to look through every single page of your data set, not unless you have a really poorly paid intern did that once. Um, but yeah, but that's really the challenge, is how do you first and foremost, it's not just taking sense from the data, it's how do you get the data to a point where you can take any sense from it? Yeah. Um, now, moving a little bit away from, from Wolfram and from science, um, I know that uh, you work, or you've worked with uh, computerbasedmath.org. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of work do you do with them, and how and why do you want to shape um, the way that maths are taught at school level? Okay. 
So computerbasedmath.org is the brainchild of um, Conrad Wolfram. He's uh, the chief strategical officer for Wolfram Research. And what we kind of, well, my role is first and foremost, I'm um, one of the lead authors on the material. So what we do is we sit down and we try and devise storylines that we're problems that we want to use to teach mathematics and particularly mathematical reasoning and problem solving. Um, my background in mathematics, you know, is a little bit flaky at times. I wasn't a formally trained mathematician, I was a formally trained scientist. So I use the bits of math I can have, which actually makes it quite interesting for this sort of work because I'm always looking at places where I think, if I was given this problem to solve, what maths would I be applying? As to why we want to do this, we have this general feeling that maths, as it is taught in schools at the moment, is the wrong subject. It's a bit like if you look back at Latin, maybe 100, 200 years ago. It was taught with the emphasis of, well, you'll never use Latin itself, but the, thing, the lessons you learn from it will be useful elsewhere. And what people realized was, well, hang on a second. Why don't we just teach those lessons, but in the shape of the tools you'll actually use? Which gives you a lot of the structure of modern um, foreign languages. They took over as Latin kind of died away. We're thinking the same thing has to happen with mathematics. You talk to the average school kid, I mean, I don't know if this is true in Germany and the rest of the world, but in England, if you ask like a kid, do you know why they're learning this? They'll go, not really. Do you know where you'll use this? Not really. You'll sit them down and you'll go, okay, here's an integral, can you solve it? But you never sit down and go, here's an integral. Do you know what that means? Do you know when you might want to build up an integral or when you might want to build a differential equation system, when you want to try and do continuous versus discrete statistics? These are the sorts of challenges that we want to start getting kids to address. And particularly, we always want to be teaching them in a context. So recent modules we've had floating around, we had a... Um, we had a project in which we wanted to be looking at teaching kids mathematics and modelling by looking at a bike race. So the equivalent in Ireland of the, uh, the Tour de France. Okay. And so the first lesson which is kind of, well, how do you go about building a model? Where are the forces? How do you represent these forces? What is the actual numerical formulation behind that? How do you go about creating an equation? How do you go about solving a system of equations? And, you know, we're still talking about 15, 16, 17 years old. So you want to keep the mathematics reasonably simple. You're not going to be trying to teach these kids pure theoretical physics equations. You're not going to be talking about quantum mechanics anytime soon. But just giving them that kind of that interest, teaching them more or less a way of saying, if I get a problem, if I get something I've never seen before, what's my thought process need to be? How do I go from A to B to C? How do I break down this big task into the small achievable chunks that I can then build on? And how do I abstract out from the real world to mathematics and then back again? So all of really the tools that, as data scientists, as computational um, mathematicians, you need to start thinking about of, I've got this messy real world problem. I can't deal with the entire thing in one lump sum. But where can I zoom in? And where can I start thinking about ways to analyze the data? So it's, oh, sorry. I was going to say, that's really So it's, it's, it's basically um, teaching uh, school-aged uh, children or teenagers not to think of maths or the math problems that they have uh, in, front of them, so in front of them as let's think of the solution right away or let's get to solve to X, but rather I have this problem and you, it's, it's teaching them how to think of a viable solution to it, like as you said, for example, with integrals and all that. Great. Um, that sounds, and I also like the, the, the meta, like thinking uh, of, math, of maths as, as a language, because you, you compare it to Latin and like, the way that you teach and learn uh, languages nowadays. Um, finally, Robert, um, why did you decide to join Data Natives? Um, what are you looking forward to the most today? Well, I've seen quite a lot floating around here about looking at uh, edutech, fintech, and health tech. And I think these are three really strong disciplines to keep our eye on for the next decade or so. I was at a quant conference the other week and the, uh, the number one takeaway from that was kind of all the big banks are getting quite scared about the fintech small startups. And being in Berlin, this seems to be like the city of the startup now. This is the place where everything is happening. And seeing what things are coming out, seeing like, I mean, it's a bit like machine learning at its heart. If you have a startup, it's small. You can have thousands of them for the same sort of money you have one big business. But it only takes one of them to make the discovery. If you throw everything against the wall, if you let all these people go, each with their own idea, each with their own track of research, if only one or two of them pan out, that could be the absolute game changer. Those could be the discoveries that could really shape what we're doing in data science and in analysis for the next decade. 
and it probably will come from a city like Berlin. Right. That that actually makes it sound very exciting. <laughs> it is. All right. Thank you so much, Robert, for taking the time. Thank you. Enjoy.